Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the public part of the committee's 20th meeting in 2018. Uh, could I just remind everyone present, please, to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent. I'd just like to remind people that Kate Forbes has given her apologies from the meeting this morning, and we are going to move on to agenda item four, which is the implications for Scotland of the UK's departure from the EU in relation to agriculture and fisheries. Before I go into the meeting, I would like to ask members to declare their interests, and I would like to declare that I'm a member of a farming partnership. Peter. I would like to also de declare that I'm a member of a farming, farming partnership as well. Sure. Um, I have a, a small registered agricultural holding. Thank you. The committee will now take evidence from the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs on agriculture, fisheries and issues following on from the UK's departure from the EU. The Secretary of State is taking part in the meeting via a video conference, and I'd like to welcome you, Secretary of State, uh, to this meeting. And I'd also like to welcome anyone watching this session on Facebook Live. Secretary of State, would you like to make a brief opening statement uh, to the meeting? We've allowed you four minutes. We're, I'm very conscious we have a lot of questions to get through and we are tight for time. So if you'd like to make an opening statement now, Secretary of State, that'd be appreciated. That's a very kind of you. Know, I, do, I just want to say I'm grateful for the opportunity to give evidence. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I hope I have the opportunity, if you'd like me to come in person, to do so before March 2019. And simply to put on the record how grateful I am to officials within the Scottish Government and indeed to ministers as well for the cooperation that we've had as we uh, seek to make sure that uh, Scotland's position as a high quality food producer um, is safeguarded, indeed enhanced as we leave the European Union. Um, during the, the year that I've been in post, I've had the opportunity to visit Scotland on a number of occasions, most recently, of course, for the Royal Highland Show at Ingleston last week. And once again, I was impressed by the energy, the entrepreneurialism um, and the imagination of Scotland's uh, primary food producers and others in the food and drink industry. And we also recognise, as I know your committee recognises, that food production and uh, respect for the environment and enhancement of our, of our countryside go together. They are two limbs and we can only make progress if we make sure that both are healthy. Thank you. Uh, Secretary say the first question is coming from uh, John Mason. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, my first question is around the area of the CAP Convergence Review. Um, we understand that uh, because, especially Scotland's uh, average uh, payments per hectare were lower than the EU average, that the UK received £190 million uh, extra for that. However, having expected £190 million to come to Scotland, we received £30 million and the other £160 million went to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, now, we understand there might have been a review about this. Can you update us at all about a review on this subject? Yes, I think that there are several issues there. It's a, um, a very fair point, and you, you sum up the, the history um, uh, absolutely correctly. Um, that money, um, of course, um, will, has been allocated, uh, is in the budgets of the, um, uh, the various different governments, the UK government and the various devolved administrations, um, and we have to respect the fact that decisions were made by the coalition government, um, which uh, all the respective devolved administrations in the UK government have given effect to. But lying behind your question is, I think, a very important point that I freely acknowledge, which is that it's in the nature of the landscape, it's in the nature of the environment in Scotland and also in other parts of the United Kingdom, um, that uh, the preponderance of less favoured areas, the nature of upland farming imposes particular challenges that require a specific level of support. So I've said to uh, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Secretary Ewing, that we need to look in the future at how we allocate funding across the United Kingdom in order to reflect that. And I recognise that there'll be different views about what happened in the past and how the money was allocated in the past that we need to take into account as we look at funding in the future. So my aim, and I've been grateful for the support that's been shown um, by others for this is to ensure that in the future we allocate funding in a way that's sensitive to the specific needs of each part of the United Kingdom. John. Now, I, I had actually understood that Lord Bew had been appointed to conduct a review, but uh, we were just waiting to hear when that review would take place. So do I take it from your first answer that there will not be a review about past funding, 
but only consideration for future funding? There'll be a consideration of future funding in the light and in the context of the decisions that were taken on, on past funding. One of the things that, that I can't do, that none of us could do, would be to claw back money that's, that's been spent, that's uh, been in budgets, that uh, uh, have already been allocated. And I know that there's a, a difference of opinions about the way in which the decision was taken over that allocation. Without prejudice to the positions that people took in the past, I've argued, and I think this is the view of others, that uh, uh, we can respect each other's differences over the past. What we need to do is to concentrate on the future in making sure that we allocate money fairly and that as we look to the future, we can look at, at why decisions were made in the past and perhaps reflect on uh, any mistakes or errors or misjudgments that might have been made then and allow those to inform the future. So what we're not doing is clawing money back. What we are doing is being aware that good arguments were made at the time and that we, in good faith, will honour the integrity of the individuals who made those arguments at the time and made those decisions at the time. Well, if I could just press you one more time on that. I mean, you did say that it's possible that a mistake or an error might have been made. And in other parts of life, mistakes and errors are made and then refunds are given by banks or a compensation is given when a mistake or an error is made. So are you saying you would not even consider looking at that past money and reallocating it, which in the scheme of things is quite small by UK terms? I absolutely take your point. Um, but I think the, uh, what, what I can't do and shouldn't do is to seek to uh, punish or penalise uh, people elsewhere in the United Kingdom. But you do make a, a fair and legitimate point, and I think it would be for the review to consider that argument alongside others. You've got the next question. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, my question focuses on future funding agri for agricultural support in Scotland. As we all know, at the moment, 16% of the funding that comes from the European Union to the UK comes to Scotland, and it is ring-fenced. In other words, the Scottish Government can't spend it on other things like health, education, whatever. So really, my question is focused on this. Is it your intention to ensure that the current level of 16% of funding that we receive in Scotland, we continue to receive it, and that that will be ring-fenced and protected so it can't be spent uh, out with the rural economy? That's absolutely, in a nutshell, yes. That, that, well, that's fantastic news. I'm really delighted that you've actually uh, able to confirm that. That, that. that is great. My supplementary question, therefore, is how do you envisage that 16% um, of funding uh, being ring-fenced, is it through the, the, the common frameworks that want to be established across the UK? Will it be up to uh, that spending within a common framework or will there be some uh, leeway given to the Scottish Government to spend some of that money for agricultural support but out with the framework or does it all have to be within the framework? <laughs> No, I think that the, the, the nature of the framework is, is simply in order to ensure that we all understand that uh, uh, Scotland's food producers sell into the UK market and, of course, sell abroad. When they're selling into the UK market, we don't want there to be any barriers to Scotland's food producers being able to have uh, consumers elsewhere in the UK buying their produce. That's, that's the purpose of the framework. But within that, what I want to do is to continue to honour the devolution settlement so that uh, should uh, Fergus or should any future minister wish to allocate that money, the 16% that we've talked about, in a slightly different way, they should be free to do so. And I know that Fergus produced a paper last week which outlined... Um, uh, proposals for future funding right up until 2024, where there was a, a, a difference of emphasis, not a dramatic difference of emphasis, but a difference of emphasis on how the money in that elongated transition period might be allocated. Um, and I think that, uh, that, to my mind, that's absolutely the way that we should go. We should respect uh, the devolution settlement. So the money is there, how it's spent should be for uh, uh, the Scottish um, uh, uh, government minister to decide. Yeah, but, um, but I just wanted to make sure that that money will be ring-fenced for the rural economy, as far as you're, you are concerned. That is my belief. That's the basis on which um, I would proceed. The only thing that I would say is that, um, uh, so far, I haven't had any indication from the Scottish Government that uh, they would take any different view. And, indeed, I, I suspect it might be the case that, in the future, 
um, we might see, uh, particularly given the nature of um, uh, Scotland's unique needs or the unique needs of other parts of the United Kingdom, that we could contribute as a proportion of overall agricultural spending an even bigger slice, possibly, to That's very uh, good Scotland news. And, and Northern Ireland, possibly, <laughs> possibly on the basis of, of, of the nature of the landscape, the unique challenges, some of the other factors. Um, and again, I, I have incented that the Scottish Government takes a, 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 a critical position on that. But one of the things, again, I, I, I have to respect is the autonomy of the devolution settlement. So uh, I think our position is, um, uh, from your questions, Mr Rumble, is very, very similar. Um, but I, I, you know, the, the, the one thing that I have grown, what's the word, um, careful about, is trying to... Um, uh, well, the one thing I don't want to do is to tie the hands of this or any future uh, Scottish government beyond um, the commitments that we've just discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Secretary of State, can I uh, ask you, just on ring fencing, uh, one of the questions that um, has been concerning people is the payment of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments yes. up until uh, 2022 in their entirety, and whether, whether yes. those that money will be guaranteed by the UK government up until that stage? Yes. Um, our proposal is that all farm income is guaranteed right up until 2022, um, and in, in cash terms, absolutely. And it's also the case um, that if agreements have been entered into, um, which run beyond 2022, in particular under Pillar 2, um, that we would honour those as well. We've also said that it's our intention, and, and, and here there's overlap between the Scottish Government position and our position, that we would continue to maintain area-based payments for uh, a number of years after 2022. Uh, the, the Scottish Government has suggested that um, uh, it would maintain them right up until 2024, but cap some of them. It's certainly the case that the, the agricultural transition that we envisage um, would last until at least 2024 as well. So there would be some maintenance of area-based payments right up until that point. OK, can, can I just push you slightly on that, just to confirm that includes payments of relating course. to forestry, um, Secretary of State? Uh, my understanding is that it would, yes. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Peter Chapman. Uh, good morning, Mr Gove. Um, my questions are about the forthcoming UK Agricultural and Fisheries Bills. You have said that the, the UK Agricultural Bill is essential to provide the legislative framework that DEFRA requires to continue to make payments to farmers and to attach conditions. So what will provide the legislative framework for Scottish farmers to continue to re receive their direct payments? Will the UK Agricultural Bill only relate to DEFRA powers or does the Scottish Government need to bring forward its own legislation? Well, it's certainly the case that right up until we leave the European Union, um, if we've got our withdrawal agreement and our transition agreement, we can carry on paying as things stand. Ideally, we will want to bring forward our own agricultural bill um, uh, in order to make provision specifically for England. And one of the things we've done is that we've shared some of the clauses of that bill with the Scottish Government, with ministers and officials. My own view, and I, again, I absolutely don't want to tie the hands of the Scottish Government. My own view would be that I would imagine the Scottish Government would want to bring forward its own agriculture bill uh, alongside or uh, just after we brought forward our agriculture bill in order to explain how direct payments and some of the criteria associated with it should be policed. I noted that um, uh, Fergus indicated that he would like to remove uh, some of the uh, onerous EU bureaucracy um, that uh, is tied to some of those payments. Um, and obviously, uh, were he to wish to do so, it might be the case that we would disapply that bureaucracy UK-wide. Fergus might want to go further than we did. That, that's a matter for discussion. If he did want to go further, then that would only reinforce the appropriateness of there being a separate uh, Scottish farming bill in the Scottish Parliament. Thank you for that. What about the fisheries bill? I mean, what will that contain and how does that re relate to, to Scottish fishing and this in interest? <laughs> We are hoping to publish a, a white paper that will lay out some of these issues um, uh, as soon as we can, um, and then a fisheries bill we hope will follow in uh, towards the end of this parliamentary session. That fisheries bill should give provision for uh, how uh, we, as the United Kingdom, for example, enter into negotiations on behalf of all the constituent parts of the of the UK with others. But it is also the case that we should specify the way in which uh, the uh, devolved uh, arrangements 
uh, work in the future and, and we don't want to for a moment disturb those. We want to make sure that Scotland can continue to use the devolved responsibilities it currently has to take advantage of the opportunities that flow, the sea of opportunities that flow from being outside the European Union. Just a final one, Mr Gove, if you could, you, you said the fisheries bill towards the end of this year, what about the agricultural bill? I think that's, that's nearer, nearer to coming <laughs> forward. Yes, you're ab absolutely right, Peter. But we, we, um, I've said that I'd like the agricultural bill to be um, before the House of Commons, before we uh, uh, rise for our summer recess at the end of July. That's my, my high hope. If, if we don't quite meet that deadline, then certainly September when we return for our brief pre-conference session would be an appropriate time, so we're cracking the whip there. The Fisheries White Paper we hope to publish again before the uh, House rises for um, its recess, and then the Fisheries legislation, the Fisheries Bill, would come in either towards the end of this year or maybe just at the beginning of 2019. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to briefly bring in uh, Stuart Stevenson for a supplementary question. Um, the present uh, arrangements, Mr Gove, for uh, EU Council meetings of one sort or another um, are such that permit uh, devolved administration ministers to act as UK ministers and to sit in the chair. Now, it doesn't happen very often, but the, the framework permits that. Do you envisage that in future that same permissions will exist in relation to provided we have an agreed UK line, of course, that ministers agree to. Um, devolved ministers might be the minister representing the UK in fisheries negotiations post-EU. I'd have no problem with that at all. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary of State. The, the next question comes from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr Gove. Um, in Scotland, the soft fruit, salmon, farming and fish processing sectors are particularly dependent on migrant workers. Now, the UK government has said it will design a new immigration policy based on the premise of controlled migration. Can you tell the committee what is meant by controlled migration, please? Yes, I think it's important that uh, people have confidence that uh, uh, an independent country like the United Kingdom will be able to determine um, a, its migration policy in the interests of its economy by making sure that we have access to the workers we need, particularly the highly skilled workers that particular sectors need. But we can also at the same time show, as all the constituent parts of the United Kingdom have always wanted to show, uh, compassion uh, towards people who may be fleeing persecution and who deserve um, uh, the chance to make a new life for themselves in this country. But also, of course, we know that um, there's a greater degree of support for migration when individual countries feel that um, it can be managed and that you don't have, for the sake of argument, um, the right of unrestricted free movement. Um, and it's certainly been observable that support for migration um, has risen since the decision, the vote, to leave the European Union and that across the United Kingdom there's a greater degree of support for uh, 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 migration. I think that's because people... Uh, knowing that they can, outside the European Union, manage the numbers who come here, are therefore more relaxed and more comfortable about being generous when we think about the, 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 the numbers who should. I think some of these sectors have already seen a fall in people wanting to come and work here from the European Union. So how will the UK government address the issue of temporary and seasonal labour, permanent labour and skilled and unskilled labour labor for the farming and food production industries, knowing that we rely on it so heavily? You're absolutely right. We have relied on labour from abroad. Um, I think there are several um, uh, points to bear in mind. The first is that um, over time, the source of labour from different parts of the European Union in our agriculture and food production sectors has changed. So a wee while ago, it, it tended to be people from Poland and from the Baltic states. Now, increasingly, it's people from Romania and Bulgaria. And that reflects the relative stage of economic development of those countries. As Romania and Bulgaria themselves become um, more successful economically, so they want naturally uh, to uh, have more of their workforce working in those countries, not going abroad. And that's been the experience, not just of the UK, but of other countries in the West of Europe who've seen people from Eastern Europe, numbers of people from Eastern Europe, drop in particular sectors. So we all have to think about looking potentially further afield. It's not just an issue for the UK, but an issue for other countries in Western Europe. And that means that we will need to think in the future about how we can make sure that workers 
uh, from, from, say, the Ukraine or other countries who want to come here uh, can, can do so in an appropriate fashion. And, of course, one of the things that I'm well aware of, having visited soft fruit growers um, in Angus and elsewhere, is that uh, seasonal workers, in particular, are a critical part of making sure, for the moment, that uh, growers can continue to run um, effective businesses. So one of the things that we're considering is what the appropriate means in the future would be for facilitating seasonal workers in order to make sure those businesses work. There's one other thing that I would say as well, which is that we all need um, uh, the expertise that EU citizens provide. For example, the official veterinarians who make sure that our abattoirs and our um, uh, meat production uh, maintains the very, very high standards on which um, our reputations rest. And we want to make sure that we can continue to have access to that high quality labour as well. All of these things help influence our approach towards migration. Thank you. Um, one last question. Do you agree that it's time that Scotland had control over its own immigration policy in order for us to design a system that suits our needs? I think it's important that uh, all the countries of the UK work together in order to ensure that the migration policy fits the needs of all. I know that in the past, um, uh, Jack McConnell, um, when he was first minister, um, uh, had a, a, what's the word, a, a, an adjustment to migration policy in, in particular respect, I think, to graduates. Um, I think the most important thing that we should do is to work collectively and collaboratively as the four countries of the United Kingdom in order to make sure that migration policy works in all our interests because our four economies are, are so highly integrated and the, and the challenges that face soft fruit growers in Angus are very similar to the challenges that face soft fruit growers in, in, uh, in Surrey or in Kent. And by working together, we can make sure that we continue to be uh, an attractive place to invest and to work. Um, a brief supplementary from Stuart. Um, I know, uh, Mr Gove, you'll be aware that about 70% of the workers in fish processing in the northeast of Scotland are non-UK citizens. And indeed, at Peterhead Academy, uh, there are 28 languages. So it's not merely EU. Are we going to be able to protect access to labour, not simply from the EU, but from across the world, because as we change migration policy, there are clear risks to a very valuable uh, northeast industry. And in particular, about 50% of the people who come to fish process, and this is my number, so you should not rely on it, appear to want to settle rather than simply be visitors. I, I can understand why anyone who's visited the northeast of Scotland would want to settle there. It's the most beautiful part of the United Kingdom. So once you're there, why would you ever want to leave, would be my view. Um, but more broadly, um, I would say that uh, we absolutely do need to make sure that uh, the processing and the catching sector have access to the labour that they need. And you're quite right, um, I'm well aware, that that labour doesn't just come from uh, the EU27. And that's why I think that we need to have a migration policy that is open to uh, skilled workers who can make a fantastic contribution to our economy from across the world. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Colin Smith. Mr Gove, um, our current EU membership allows participation in three EU protected food name schemes, which, which gives protections against imitations throughout the EU. Now, this issue obviously remains unresolved. So can you tell us what exactly are your proposals regarding EU protected food name schemes once the UK leaves the EU? Well, we want to make sure that uh, geographical indications um, are recognised um, as we leave the European Union, so does the EU. We have a number um, um, which, uh, which really matter to us. From, um, uh, from Orkney to our growth, it's integral to make sure that uh, the reputation of Scottish and indeed UK produce um, is protected and enhanced as we leave the EU. Um, but the EU have many, many geographical indications that they would also like to see protected and preserved as we leave. So this is part of the ongoing negotiation between ourselves and the EU in order to make sure that our respective interests are both protected. So can you tell us then, because this is unresolved and you say it is part of those negotiations, when will producers of products such as Scotch whisky actually have certainty regarding their protection? When will it be enshrined in UK law? Well, at the moment, uh, there's a debate as to whether or not uh, geographical indications should be part of the withdrawal agreement which is, as you know, the formal technical legal text which is required under Article 50 to give effect to the UK leaving the EU, or whether it should be part of the future economic partnership. And we're anxious, the UK government is anxious, to be um, as clear as possible, as early as possible. But of course, 
um, in any negotiation with the EU, we have to respect uh, their autonomy and their desire to um, make sure that their interests are protected and preserved. But as I say, my judgment is that because there are many, many more geographical indications that EU nations have compared to the UK, that they would want to have those um, uh, guarantees and those safeguards. So it's in their interest, much as it is in their interests to to guarantee tariff-free access for um, uh, agri-food products across the UK-EU border. Um, but the other thing that I would say is that um, we know that Scotch whisky, Scottish salmon, um, have been huge uh, success stories. And one of the reasons why they've been success stories is it's not just the uh, important ge geographical indication uh, and protected status that that brings that's been in, 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 in instrumental in generating success. It's also been the hugely successful marketing of individual brands and individual companies that have acquired a worldwide reputation for this amazing high-quality produce. But, but you do accept that if those current protections are not in place for something like Scotch whisky, as soon as somebody can imitate it, they will certainly imitate it. Well, it's all important that we get the best protection possible, of course, for uh, Scottish whisky and for other brands. And one of the things that I want to do is to make sure that we get, the, uh, we maintain all the protections that we have at the moment, and we provide a strong platform for the future um, for these brands to. Um, to meet the growing demand that there is. And, and that's absolutely uh, something in which uh, my department, uh, the Department for International Trade and the Scottish Government are 100% aligned. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Mr Gove. Um, one, of the most, uh, one of the most vocal and perhaps discursive areas uh, in recent months uh, in this Parliament has been around common UK frameworks um, and the uh, devolution of powers uh, after the transition period. I, I was wondering, Mr Gove, if you could outline some of the areas where you think there is a, uh, a need for common UK f frameworks in specific relation to agricultural regulation uh, and policy and why you think those areas are important. Well, I think that, to take one, um, I think animal and plant health would be one. What we want to do is we want to provide uh, consumers across the United Kingdom with a guarantee that the same standards, the same high standards to which we're all committed, are maintained across the UK. Um, now, uh, my, my, my approach is that I'm always, always open to an argument from any devolved administration about a way in which it might want to innovate or to do something better. I think part of the strength of devolution is that individual uh, governments and parliaments uh, can often um, uh, generate ideas about progress that the rest of us will want to follow. But there are some areas where uh, frameworks provide everyone with a reassurance and a, a safety net that um, uh, we would all buy into. And as I say, animal and plant health would be my number one uh, area where I would imagine that uh, all of us would agree that we could all benefit from an effective UK-wide framework. Uh, thank, you, thank you for that. And, and just moving that um, discussion on, not just around common frameworks, but actually around... Uh, where each respective government is going in terms of policy and subsidy strategy. One of the complaints about CAP has been that it hasn't always been fair uh, or indeed beneficial to UK and Scottish farmers and that the subsidy structure is indeed overly complicated uh, in many respects. Can I ask for your views on whether you think it is likely that we will have UK-wide uh, policies around future uh, agricultural subsidies or is it your intention that we have UK common frameworks around regulation uh, and trade, for example, but devolved uh, responsibilities around subsidies and funding. Uh, where do you think we're heading post-transition on that? I think your point is absolutely correct. We do need to have those. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I mentioned animal and plant health is that it makes it much easier for us to secure new opportunities to trade abroad um, and to make sure that our producers have uh, access to or improved access to markets abroad. But you're also right that there are problems with the existing common agricultural policy subsidy uh, approach um, and uh, the different constituent nations of the United Kingdom can all do better. And one of the things that um, uh, I mentioned briefly earlier is that um, uh, Fergus's um, uh, proposals for um, life outside the European Union envisage the delivery of support to the farming sector um, without some of the bureaucracy that the EU currently imposes, and I think that's absolutely the right way to go. And just as a brief supplementary before we move on to our themes, wh whose responsibility is it then to develop 
uh, agricultural policy in the long term. So not, not during transition, but uh, after we leave the EU. Yes. Uh, is it the Scottish government? Is it the UK government? Is it a bit of both? You know, there's been a lot of discussion around that in the Holyrood yes. Chamber uh, that the Cabinet Secretary in Scotland says he can't really develop policy until he has some guarantees of long-term funding, for example. So I think there's still a, a lot of discussion around uh, where the money's coming from and whose job it is to develop agricultural yes. policy. So what, what are your views on that? Well, my view is that it's a devolved matter and that it's for the... Uh, cabinet secretary and the Scottish government to do that. You know, we've provided um, um, uh, uh, a plan and an outline for what we want to do uh, in England, and we've also provided a degree of guarantee on funding, which is actually uh, uh, what's the word uh, more detailed than than any other country in the EU um, uh, has. You know, the, the, at the moment, the Common Agricultural Policy in its current form ends in 2020, and while there's active discussion about what might replace it. Folk don't know. So you have a, a clearer guide. The cash commitment that we've made is up, up to 2022. The fact that we've talked about an agricultural transition and direct payments continuing thereafter. A clearer guide to the backdrop here in the UK than you have anywhere else in Europe. But within that, I think that you are absolutely right. Fergus has laid out what might happen until 2024. I think the, the, the question that people are asking is great, but what comes after that? We've outlined what we believe is an approach which helps to make farming more productive in England and also to safeguard the environment. And the sense that I have is that um, the people in Scotland uh, want the Scottish Government to be a little clearer about what that future direction of travel might be post-2024. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Kabira. I, th I think my first question is probably a fairly brief one, um, in relation to the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which has been so valuable to many of uh, Scotland's coastal communities. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the Shared Prosperity Fund, which is, I understand will replace it, and how that will work in relation to the distribution of money. Yes, um, we had a meeting um, of government ministers uh, about a fortnight ago to discuss the Shared Prosperity Fund. And one of the points that I made then is that uh, we acknowledge that there are... Um, if you, the purpose of the Shared Prosperity Fund is to support those parts of the United Kingdom that most need government support in order to improve productivity and to make sure that economic development is fairly spread. And as we both know, two of the areas where uh, we uh, need to do more are rural areas and coastal communities because of decisions that have been taken in the past. So one of the points that I made at that meeting is that um, we need to make sure that rural development programmes are effectively funded through our Share Prosperity Fund alongside anything that we might do in terms of agricultural uh, support, and also that we need to make sure that our replacement to the EMFF makes sure that there is proper investment in coastal communities, not least because, as research which the Scottish Government itself has commissioned has shown, when we take back control of our territorial waters, we'll be landing hugely more fish, or we have the potential to land hugely more fish than we do at the moment, um, and if we're going to take advantage of that sea of opportunity, then we need to make sure that we've got investment in our harbours and the other facilities uh, required alongside it as well. Um, you've just used the uh, Scottish Fishermen's Federation's phrase, sea of opportunity. And I want to just uh, ask some questions about, about that, because it's quite clear in the fishermen's minds uh, that uh, the UK and Scotland should assume responsibility over who fishes and how they fish in our waters up to 200 miles. Now, I know that uh, UK ministers have discussed some of this with, uh, for example, the Danish government and with the Dutch government. Um, if the Danish part of my family went and asked the Danish minister what they'd taken uh, as to future uh, commitments in relation to their rights to fish in our waters, what do you think the Danish minister should say? Well, it, it, I, I, I hesitate to offer advice to a, to a minister in the Scottish government. I would certainly pause before offering advice to a minister in the Danish government. But your question is a very fair one. I'd say two things. Um, uh, as we leave, we become an independent coastal state. That's a, a matter of law. That means that we uh, can decide, we negotiate access to our own waters, we can decide who comes here. But I think everyone acknowledges that um, it will be the case in the future that just as uh, Scots fishermen will want to fish in other countries' waters, so we will allow fishermen from other nations 
to fish here, but it will be in our terms. So um, we will uh, make sure that we negotiate every, uh, every year, um, as independent coastal states like Norway and Iceland and the Faroes do, access to our waters. And I think that uh, uh, other countries well understand how that, that procedure operates. Um, you use the phrase, uh, we will negotiate on our terms and we will do so every year. Um, am mm. I therefore to take, Mr Gove, that uh, no commitment to allow foreign vessels to fish in our waters will last for more than a single year? Well, I think, again, it's for negotiation. You know, one of the things that uh, we might want to do as a, 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 as a country is to come to an arrangement with others over the, the nature and the scale of the access that they have. But it would be our decision. Um, but it's in the nature of any negotiation for us to make those decisions on the basis of what's in our sovereign interest, the interest of our coastal communities, the interest of our uh, catching fleet. Um, no, I... Sorry, I could bring Peter in and I'll come back to you. You'll you're... finish that little bit. I think you might find it useful. I think I'll bring Peter in and right, come fine. back to you. Peter. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I mean, Mr Gove, you know that the implementation period meant that we were in the CFP until the end of December 2020. I, my question is that it's important for our fishermen to be involved in the negotiations on quota at the November-December quota discussions. Otherwise, we'll be, we'll be shut out from having any income in, in, input into our quota uh, allocation for another full year. Can you, t can you guarantee that... Our, our fishermen will be involved in that negotiations at November, December 2020 going forward. Yes, our, uh, the, the, the catch community, the processing industry, um, we want to make sure that um, we hear their voices, that they're involved in helping ship the negotiations. There will be a, a December council, obviously, um, uh, in 2018, which will be broadly you know, uh, uh, the rules as before, but in 2019, uh, sorry, 2020, the final December Council, will be negotiating in a different uh, uh, position to that which we've been negotiating before. And we want to make sure that we're ready for that and ready for the opportunities that will come from us being fully outside the CFP from 1st January 2021. Stuart. Uh, just to close th this off before I move to another brief topic. Um, at the moment, about 60% of UK fish is caught by other nations. Uh, in uh, Norway, it's about 16%, Iceland about 10%. But both Iceland and Norway get something for that, whereas it's not clear the UK, and Scotland in particular, gets anything for the 60%. So are we quite clear that when we negotiate trades across border, as of necessity we will have to do in future, as we do now, that there will be a benefit derived uh, from letting foreign vessels come into our uh, economic area out to 200 miles. Yes, absolutely. And, and you put the case very well. I'm sorry, you, you, I'm going to come back to you if I've got time at the end, because I would like to bring in one or two other people. And, and Richard, you, Richard Lyle, you're the next person on the OK, question. good morning, Mr Gove. Um, can I turn this to the subject of forestry? Um, the UK is now the second largest net importer of forest products in the world, second only to China. The UK imports 80% of wood it consumes and the vast majority of its softwood, which can be grown very well in the UK. Post-Brexit, will the UK government try to reduce our reliance on imported wood as part of its new international trade strategy? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that uh, we... Uh, are committed to as a government on a UK level is to planting more trees and to supporting the forestry sector. You're right that um, as countries go, the UK is um, as a whole um, uh, deforested um, or uh, that the amount of forest cover that we have, the, 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 the strength of our forestry sector is less than it should be. Now, there are some reasons, I think, why under the operation of the Common Agricultural Policy, we haven't properly incentivised forestry. We haven't supported forestry in the way that we should have done. I should commend uh, the Scottish Government and Fergus Ewing for the energetic way in which he's championed forestry. And in the most recent conversation that I had with Fergus just last week, uh, he made um, uh, a very generous offer there to have the Scottish Government help the UK 
to um, make sure that we uh, had um, a, a, an increased supply of domestic timber. And that is something that I will want to take forward. The premise of your question, I think, is a fair one, and the outcome that you want us to see is one that we do want to achieve. In your 25-year environmental plan, HEP made a commitment to plant 180,000 hectares of new woodland by the end of 2042. Exactly. That means that an average planting target of 7 and a half thousand hectares, which is half the Scottish Government's target of 15,000 hectares each year by the middle of the next day, decade. Do you think the Scottish target is too ambitious, or is the English target not ambitious enough? I think that uh, it re those different targets reflect the geography of our of our two different countries. Um, the, the, the key lesson um, that many of us have learnt from uh, forestry expansion in the past is that you need to have the right trees in the right locations. Um, and without wanting to go into some of the problems that we had with planting in the flow country in the past uh, in too much detail, we need to make sure that we plant appropriately. Um, and Scotland has uh, both the geography and the willingness to be able to meet ambitious targets, the targets that we have in the 25-year environment plan. We will, of course, uh, revisit. It's a living document in the future to see if we should be more ambitious. But it's in the very nature of the specific geography and constraints in England um, that uh, there are, are sites and locations which would not be suitable for forestry. Um, and we need to reflect that in our um, in our plan. Thank you very much. Uh, and an answer to, if I can relate now to, back to farming subsidies, an answer to Jamie Green, you said that you'd get already given the Scottish Government information in regard to the uh, farming subsidies uh, funding post-Brexit. Um, can you tell me when you did that? Yes, we've done so in correspondence um, um, on a number of occasions and also in meetings that I've had with the um, uh, not just the Scottish government, but also other devolved administrations as well. Um, but of course, the... the, the, um, uh, sorry, the sorry, Mr. Desire. Was that recently in the last couple of months or six months ago or last week? Yes, well, there's... there's I can share the correspondence that we've had. I mean, last week we had a brief conversation with Fergus at the Royal Highland Show. Before that, uh, we've had regular meetings. The last time that we met as a group of devolved administrations was in Edinburgh, I think, um, more than six weeks ago. And we had a discussion then about future financing um, in which a number of questions were raised and um, addressed, some of which were subsequently addressed in, in correspondence between myself, Fergus and Leslie Griffiths. The Scottish Government has the, the, the numbers, the, the actual millions that you're going to ensure are going to be paid up post-Brexit, yes? Well, I think that we've, we've given, as I mentioned earlier, more guarantees about the future of agricultural funding than it's possible for um, any other European country to give. We've said that there will be guaranteed funding for agriculture in cash terms at the same level right up until 2022. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier in response to Jamie's question, the EU has uh, uh, its current common agricultural policy funding guaranteed only until 2020, and they're debating at the moment what might happen thereafter. And it, one of the, the, the challenges that they have is that now that the UK as a net contributor is leaving the EU, they have to try and work out um, how they're going to make sure that their common agricultural policy uh, works with, with, with simply less pennies to go round. Thank you, Mr Gould. Um, and the next Thank question you. is from uh, John, John Finney. John. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Secretary of State. Um, the, Hi, good afternoon. Uh, uh, implications for Scotland of the UK's departure from the EU is the title of this session, and uh, um, it peppers a lot of the work of the Parliament, as you'll understand. Secretary yeah. of State, um, you, you mentioned, if I noted you correctly, to say you'd been several times in Scotland and you hope to be here before March 19. This is a unicameral setup, and the role of committees in scrutinising is vital. Um, I wonder if yes. you'd want to take the opportunity to apologise to this committee for frustrating our efforts to scrutinise the Scottish Government due to your um, not making yourself available until the day before the Parliament goes into recess. Well, I, I am sorry. Mr. State, sorry. I'm very happy for you to answer that question. I, I think a point has been made by Mr. Finney. If you want to answer the question, I'm delighted you to do that. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, thank you. I, mean, um, I, I would apologise for any discourtesy. I, mean, I, I have tried to make myself available to um, uh, Scottish ministers, and I'm now making myself available for uh, questioning. And I've made myself available, of course, 
to Scotland's food producers um, and to uh, Scottish uh, citizens on a number of occasions. Um, I, we don't keep a leak table of the number of times that UK secretaries of state have been in, in devolved administrations, but I think, and I'd be happy to be corrected, that I've visited Scotland in the last year more often than any other UK cabinet minister. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, and that, that's noted, uh, Mr Gove. Of course, the question was about attendance at this meeting, and uh, there have been yes. several occasions where meetings have been scheduled and, and cancelled. And, of course, yes. our job to scrutinise the Scottish Government, um, I believe, has mm. been handled by that. But perhaps if I can move on to, to a number of questions, please. And, um, Secretary of State, it's, it's about the consultation on the live animal exports, which is something that yes. the UK will require to pick up on. Now, you've issued a call for evidence on controlling live exports for slaughter and to improve animal welfare during mm. transport. Um, as I understand things, and people would understand that export for breeding is invariably high-value uh, stock, which is uh, well, well looked after. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue of slaughter uh, is important. But I want to ask you about another category, and that is the, the category of um, a pr um, export for processing, which, as I understand, is the fattening for eventual slaughter. And there's a concern that there's a potential loophole in this consultation where animals which are not being immediately slaughtered um, could still be the subject of export. Could you comment on that, please? Yes, um, the, the call for evidence is precisely that. Um, it's intended to ensure that um, the arguments that you make um, are, and the arguments that others have made are properly reflected. And one of the things that I should say is that last Thursday, when I was talking to the NFU Scotland, um, their representatives made a particular point, of course, about uh, the transport of animals from Orkney and Shetland to Aberdeen for precisely the reasons that you um, allude to. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that any framework that we have in the future, any approach that we have in the future, respects uh, the, uh, the needs of Orkney and Shetland farmers and the way in which um, uh, you know, their, their um, transport of animals from the islands to the mainland is integral to their business model. Yeah, yes, uh, certainly. And as a representative of the Highlands and Islands, I absolutely understand. And it is the highest standards that apply there. The concern is about... Absolutely. Yeah, uh, there is this concern about this word processing. And as I understand it, I mean, for instance, are you aware that there's thousands of calves leave Scotland each year for processing? And these may well, may well be slaughtered, sorry, uh, um, Secretary State, will be slaughtered within days of arriving at these destinations. And the destinations can quite often be Spain. <clears throat> Indeed, it's been suggested to be North Africa. And the route taken is they're exported from Scotland into Northern, the north of Ireland and through the Republic and shipped from there. Well, I, I hope that you can share the evidence and that those who've shared evidence with you can share it with us so that we can consider that as we think about what the right regulatory approach would, should be. Because, as you quite rightly point out, we, we are very proud of the high standards of animal welfare that we have across the United Kingdom. And part of the purpose of the call for evidence is to make sure that um, as we leave the European Union, we cannot hold the very highest standards. That's very reassuring. Can I ask you, Secretary of State, about the level of cooperation with the uh, Scottish Government about this. I asked questions of uh, Cabinet Secretary Mr Ewing recently and he made the comments about the inter-island movement or the island to the mainland movement. Of course, that is not the yes. concern. It is the longer journeys that, that the concern is. I understand. Yes, no, I understand. And, and um, uh, Fergus is um, uh, energetic in, in, in um, uh, making his case to us, but we uh, absolutely appreciate these broader animal welfare concerns that you have raised, and I believe that the Scottish Government are uh, sensitive to those as well. Um, uh, Final one. OK, thank you. Um, Secretary of State, can you comment if whether there's been an assessment made on the impact a full ban would have on the agricultural sector? Uh, we're in the process of gathering the evidence in order to make such an assessment. OK, thank you very much. Um, some some uh, more general questions now from individual members. The first one is from Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, touch on something around trade and its uh, relationship with agriculture in the UK. One of the opportunities of leaving the EU is the UK's ability to strike up new and interesting deals with third-party countries uh, in other parts of the world. But how do you think we can strike that important balance between protecting our domestic agriculture industries uh, whilst balancing the need to do these new deals? And by that, I mean uh, the fears among some in the farming community around the uh, flooding of the market with new products 
uh, from countries where we, we do these trade deals. And can I ask how you think your voice uh, will be heard uh, uh, amongst your uh, cabinet colleagues when they are striking trade deals yes. to make sure that the interests of UK and Scottish farmers is at the forefront of any deals that we do? Uh, well, the first thing to say is that um, <clears throat> uh, there's unity across uh, the government that we must not, as we uh, strike new trade deals, undermine the high standards of animal welfare or high environmental protection standards that we have here. Because um, uh, produce, whether it's uh, Scottish or elsewhere in the UK, relies on a, a quality hallmark in order to ensure that it commands a premium price. So we're not going to erode those standards. And my colleagues from Liam Fox to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, from David Davis to the Prime Minister, have all reinforced that message whenever there's been an opportunity to do so. But it's also the case that, and I'll take two examples, I'll try and be relatively brief. Um, it, it is also the case, though, that, that increased export access can help domestic producers. We know that, for example, there is a currently declining um, uh, demand for sheep meat in the UK. Um, now, I, um, I think that's a shame. I, I, I want to do everything I, I can in order to encourage people to um, and enjoy and to appreciate um, Scottish lamb, UK sheep meat more, more, more generally. But it's a fact at the moment. There are, however, growing uh, markets in the Middle East and elsewhere for uh, UK sheep meat that we should, uh, I, I hope, access, which will make sure that uh, upland farmers have a secure future. There's another area as well. When it comes to pig farming, obviously a big concern in the northeast, we know that there are parts of the of the animal that um, aren't necessarily the consumer's favourite here, but are very uh, 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 attractive in other export markets. If we manage to get more exports into those markets, that means that one half of the animal, as it were, can be sold there. The other half of the animal can be sold and consumed here. And that means that we can have... Uh, 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 a better way of satisfying domestic demand here, as well as earning some export dollars too. So trade in those ways can actually help us to ensure that our domestic producers are in a stronger position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, convener, Mr. Gove. Um, I mean, I wanted to have another go at this, what was going to happen after 2022. Mr. Lyle and Mr. Green both asked you about that. And... I mean, I think the committee is frustrated because we are hearing from Mr Ewing that he cannot plan ahead beyond that, and you're telling us that you're open to kind of plans. I mean, under the EU, Scotland has a complete freedom to really do what it wanted under the EU rules, which could be different from England. How much freedom does Scotland have to do exactly what it wants in the future? For example, if we want to blur the line between agriculture and forestry, do we have complete freedom to do that? Or is there the possibility that the UK will intervene on that? Um, my view is that um, we don't want to interfere, take a single power, abrogate the freedom of manoeuvre of the Scottish Government at all. No one has put to me any good reason why we should do so. I have no appetite or desire to do so. My view is that actually, as we leave the European Union, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government acquire more powers um, and um, a good thing too. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Mike Rumbles, followed by John Finney. Th thank you very much, Convener. I would actually like to just follow up on your answers to, to John Finney about um, giving evidence to the committee. And I have, can I just first preface the question by saying that I think your questions, answers to me earlier on were excellent and very helpful. Um, you may not be aware, but I don't know if you are, but 18 months ago um, in the Scottish Parliament, we passed a unanimous motion um, requesting uh, Fergus Ewing to start designing a bespoke system of agricultural support in Scotland. And every time Fergus Ewing has appeared before the committee and made a statement in Parliament and to our questions, he's consistently come back and told us he cannot possibly proceed with this because he hasn't, I'm afraid, according to him, his evidence to this committee, had from you the detail of financial support available for him. He says he cannot possibly produce the plan without the financial support. You are now telling us that you've told Mr. F uh, Mr. Ewing some time ago that he's got all the information he needs to design such a system. So what the point I'm trying to make, and perhaps John made it a little bit more bluntly than I am, it would have been immensely helpful for our role in holding the Scottish Government to account if you were, had been able to come to give us that evidence at an earlier point. And I think um, giving, taking evidence from you helps us to, hold, to do our job in holding the Scottish Government account. So I hope perhaps you could 
appear more regularly. This is the first time you've appeared for the committee. It would be immensely helpful if we could keep that dialogue going. Absolutely, and I absolutely take your point. I'd be delighted to do so. Thank you, and uh, Secretary of State, I'm sure we'll welcome the opportunity to question you more. And uh, I'm afraid we have time for one more question, which is from John Finney. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Secretary of State, I, I'm referring to a document from uh, February 2018, um, Health and Harmony, the Future of Food, Farming and Environment in a Green Brexit. And in particular, um, the, the passage on devolved powers in paragraph 7. Mm. Now, it's fairly lengthy, so I'll, I'll not go into it. I'll just perhaps quote the last sentence, if I may, please, and a quote from paragraph 7. It is the government expectation that the process will lead to an increase in decision-making powers for each of the devolved administrations. Uh, Secretary State, can you outline like, what additional decision-making powers you're referring to in that sentence, please? Yes, um, I think that there'll be now, I hope, the opportunity, and it, it touches on what um, Mike Rumbles was talking about, for the Scottish Government to spell out in greater detail how it might design schemes to support um, as Scottish farmers both to improve food production and also to safeguard the environment. My view is that outside the European Union, we have uh, the opportunity to design different methods of support. The Scottish Parliament, we discussed earlier, will have the money, um, and it will be for the Scottish Parliament, free of some of the constraints that the EU imposed, to decide how that money should be spent in order to support the rural economy, food producers, um, environmental interests. And what I hope we'll see is within the, um, the UK framework, which safeguards uh, animal and plant health and other environmental standards within that, uh, there'll be scope for creativity. Um, and it may well be the case that, as we've seen from Norway and Switzerland, um, that you can have uh, countries outside the EU committed to high standards with improved um, uh, rural environments and also very healthy um, export-led food production sectors. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Secretary Thank you. I, I'm, I'm conscious that we've come to the end of our time. I, I personally would like to thank you, and I, I, I know the committee would welcome your attendance at a meeting, and we found this very useful with the, with the video set up. We do hope that next time we'll be able to encourage you uh, to come to Scotland and appear before in front of the committee. I think that would be extremely helpful. I would like to thank you for taking the time uh, today to, to give your evidence. And I'd like to thank all the viewers on Facebook Live for, for, for watching this. And that, Secretary of State, concludes our business today. And therefore, I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you again. Thank you.